Welcome to the Sunshiny Day podcast from the British Council. This podcast has been created to put a little sunshine into your lives. And a little bit of English too. Whether you are young, old or really old. Locked in, locked down or locked out of your house. There's something for you here. In this episode, we're going to hear from a whole bunch of incredible people from all over the world. And who just happen to be connected to the British Council. They're going to be telling stories, playing musical instruments, sharing secret recipes, and telling us about a few of their favourite things. Okay, so what are we waiting for? Let's Let's go! go. So, um, can you tell us your name? Lily. Okay, and how old are you, Lily? Uh, nine. And what have you got here? What's this? Uh, my ukulele, and if you want, I can play piano. Okay, you play two instruments then, ukulele and piano. And I'm learning a little bit about the guitar. And a little bit of guitar as well. Okay, well, let's just concentrate on this one for now. So, uh, tell us about this instrument. Um, it looks kind of like a small guitar, is that right? Yes, that's why I also really like guitar. So I got this, like, this was the third instrument and last one until now that I got. And it's like, and it's actually quite easy to play that a guitar because it's like you don't have to stretch your arms as much as in a guitar because it's much bigger and it has much bigger, like, black gaps in it. Mm. And, um, and it has only like four strings that play beautifully in a very light tone and if you just want to you can get it like you can do it with more strength and then it's going to go louder and louder and it's very nice so this the ukulele i can see it only has four strings how many strings does a guitar have normally like six right okay and this one is it's much smaller so it's easier for you to hold is yes, that right yes because um because it's much lighter, okay. not that heavy, and if you want, and I don't have one of those ropes that you tie on each end of the instrument and then you have it, but it's still much easier and like more comfortable for you to be able to hold it, because okay. it hasn't, doesn't have a very big, like, big part here in the end. Right, and this one's a beautiful colour. What colour would you call that? Um, I'd call this like a, a grassy green. It's more or less like a turquoise, but just a more greeny. Okay. Do, do all ukuleles come in this green colour? No, most of the ukuleles normally come in a tone uh, brown. And if you want, you can order it in whatever colour you want. But um, it might have like drawings in the circle. But it's always different and you can't like make it whatever you want, but it's still beautiful when you get it. Okay. Can we hear a little bit? Okay. Um, so you said it had four strings. Can we hear each string? This is four. Lovely. Okay. Can you play something? Um... Beautiful. Is that one of your songs? Um, no, this is by Grace Vanderwall and she made uh, her first song, Bobby Forst, um, that she performed on America's Got Talent is I Don't Know My Name and it's a very nice, simple one. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
a story uh, for this section of Amazing Families about your grandmother, grandma, granny, uh, what do you call her? Because there are so many names for that member of the family, aren't there? Uh, she's my dearly departed Nana um, yep, from New Zealand. Okay, Nana. Right. Let's hear about your Nana. Uh, so my Nana was a um, very intelligent, very cheeky, uh, very compassionate uh, woman. Um, she was actually a children's book writer. Um, and a poet. Um, one of her poems was featured in New Zealand's uh, top 100 poems um, of all time in New Zealand. Um, and uh, when she did her children's writing, she was actually very pol politically incorrect. Um, so even the titles of some of her books, I wouldn't really be able to um, tell you uh, right now. But yeah, the story I'd like to tell you about um, is a, a Christmas story um, and it involved cooking. Um, and while my grandmother had sort of great uh, literary talents, um, this didn't really extend to um, her skills in the kitchen. She was a bit of a disaster. So our little tradition um, every, every Christmas was to try to kind of maneuver my grandmother away from the kitchen um, for sort of self-protection. However, um, yeah, she would always seem to find a way sort of back in. Um, and uh, usually uh, she'd be able to sort of demand and, and find her way back to uh, making her traditional um, Christmas trifle. Um, and the key ingredient in that trifle was um, sherry or sometimes pork, uh, which is, I guess you guys, people know from Porto, a, a fairly strong sort of alcohol. Um, and my grandmother would usually have, um, you know, like a couple of gulps herself and then add a little bit to the trifle and as the sort of port kind of took effect um, in combination with my grandmother kind of uh, losing her memory a little bit in her latter years um, the trifle would get more and more of a kind of a kick as she added more and more port um, to the uh, recipe and so um, we had another little Christmas tradition um, every 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 Christmas we'd have our, our kind of picnics outside and uh, we put a, a, a kitchen table uh, sort of out in the out in the, my grandfather's garden and so uh, one of our Christmas traditions was that our um, dog got drunk um, <laughs> every every Christmas um, can oh, you guess you, why I'm starting to guess the end of the story yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our entire family would try to, you know, distract my grandmother's attention, and we'd we'd throw the uh, the trifle under the table, where the dog would uh, <laughs> the dog would uh, you know scoff it down, and uh, so our dog would end up sort of, you know, a little bit uh, a little bit drunk and asleep under the table every Christmas. Wow, lucky dog. <laughs> <laughs> or unlucky, or unlucky. Yeah, I'm not sure if the uh, animal rights uh, people would have something to say about that. But. Uh, yeah, no, but it was a, it was a lovely, it was a lovely kind of memory. Uh, all, all that's good and bad about Christmas, I think. here in the recipe part of the uh the podcast and i can't 
make out why you were, you know, just to be a little bit impolite, why you were invited, you know, because I, I never got to eat it eat any of your cooking in all these years so my first question is that you know why are you here <laughs> because you asked me to be here <laughs> i think you get crashed i really you're don't. gonna love what i'm gonna say but it's because you always cooked really well so i'm like i can't compete with oh, like oh. duck entrees and i don't know it's ridiculous it's really good <laughs> so <laughs> And also, we used we to just... always just go out to eat, didn't we? So that's true. That's true. Those Hong Kong nights, yeah. Yeah, Hong um, Kong good food. So we're not actually British. Uh, we're we're from the colonies. Um, you're from <laughs> Canada. Yeah. Can you share a little bit of where we're talking? Our, our theme this podcast is very much, you know, based on the family and family memories. What memories of food in Canada do you have? Well, it's weird because in, well, in Canada, I mean, most of us are, like me, are first generation. So what we always ate at home wasn't like typical Canadian food, you know, like my parents were European, German and Latvian, so, or are European. Um, so I had a lot of German food, Latvian food, French food as well, um, except for like, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving, we'd always do turkey. So there we did like Canadian stuff, but otherwise okay. it was like meat and potatoes, vegetables. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, you're going to share with us, I think, a um, a recipe for your favorite uh, comfort food. Um, is that um, a Latvian recipe or a Canadian recipe? Well, or it's your actually own? Mexican or Tex-Mex. <laughs> In Canada, we have a lot, it, you know, it's like a, we have loads of any cuisine you want, you can have access to. And one of my favorites is like tacos, burritos, nachos. So what I've developed now is I make like a taco mix, but I make it vegetarian. So without beef, I do it just with beans. And then with a bunch of Mexican spices um, and chili, you can make it as hot as you want. And I, what I do is I take the tortilla and I cut it into four. So you've got four big triangles and I deep fry them. And yeah, <laughs> it's not very healthy, <laughs> but you deep fry them. And then when you dry them, like you put them in the colander to dry, and then I sprinkle paprika on them or lime on some, just to give them a little bit of extra flavor. And then because they're big triangles, they're hard, and you dip them into the taco mix then and eat it like that. It's really good. But, okay. Sounds like... Yeah, mm. the deep fry is a bit unhealthy, but the taco mix itself yeah. is healthy, so it's a balance. Perhaps we should insert a health warning here, you know, please consult your cardiologist before trying this recipe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to be putting uh, putting up your recipe uh, on our homepage um, and we're going to invite people to attempt your recipe and uh, perhaps take photos um, and there may be a little prize for the winning chef. Um, so that could be quite exciting. Um, so. Yeah. Your uh, influence will be spreading, Nicole. How do you feel yes, about that? Yes, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> World domination. <laughs> so, you'll have to rename the uh, Mexican, like, I mean, Tex-Mex will have to become something else, won't it, because of you, with your new revolution. What, do you have any names from the t top of your head? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I've only had Latvian one coffee Latvian. this morning so far. Can I, can I put it on the Facebook page? I'll think of something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, lovely to talk to you. Um, and yeah, we're I looking. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, um, we're going to post your recipe up on the uh, Facebook page. Um, and as I said, yeah, invite any, anyone to um, participate, maybe cook with your mum and dad. Um, make sure that they approve of your dietary choices, especially with Nicole's recipe. Um, and <laughs> it's really easy to make, so 
Yeah. Sounds delicious. So we, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing your photos. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Cool, thanks for having me, Call. Talk to you later. Bye. Ciao. A burglar, knowing that the owners of the house were out for the evening, broke into a house in the middle of the night. He was silently creeping through the pitch dark living room when suddenly he was startled by a voice. Jesus is watching you. He froze for a few moments, but having heard nothing else, he was just thinking it had been his imagination when suddenly he heard it again, louder and clearer this time. Jesus is watching you. This time he managed to point his torch in the direction of the voice and saw at the far end of the room in a large cage a brightly coloured parrot. He approached the bird. Did you say that? He asked. Jesus is watching you, the bird squawked in reply. What's your name, parrot? He asked. Rodney, said the parrot. Rodney, replied the burglar. What a silly name for a parrot. Which idiot called you Rodney? Quick as a flash, the parrot replied. The same idiot who called the pit bull Jesus. My name is Carla and I'm from Northern Ireland and I'm currently teaching English from my flat in Lisbon. Um, but right now I'm going to imagine that I am on a beautiful desert island all by myself. The sun is on my skin but not too hot because we Irish are quite pale and burn easily and the sand is warm under my feet. As I'm walking along, I come across an old uh, battered kind of cool looking vintage suitcase, which I open and I find four items. And these four items are all things that are very important to me. The first item, I don't think you can really call it an item, is a uh, because it's my dog, Dexter. Um, Dexter is a small, kind of scruffy border terrier with a kind of a very big personality for such a small dog. He's been uh, with me since he was a puppy. I got him six years ago and he's kind of been a constant in my life when there have been a lot of difficult things, a lot of changes and he's just been something that's always there. Dogs, I think, just bring joy to you. Um, if you have one, just they take such joy in kind of the smallest things that it's a really good kind of perspective in life and it's someone to look after too and be looked after by sometimes. Dexter currently lives with my parents because um, he was supposed to come with me to Portugal follow me after I got settled in but he moved in with them and they love him so much that they're not going to give him up which I completely understand and in fairness he's spoiled rotten there it's like they've got a grandchild in fact I came uh, home one Christmas to discover uh, a photograph of Dexter with Santa Claus before Christmas which uh, wouldn't be my choice but at least he's having a great time My second item is a book by a man called Matt Haig and it's called Notes on a Nervous Planet. Um, I'm an avid reader. I read probably a book every week or two and um, normally it's fiction. I like young adult fiction, quite complex stuff, quite um, challenging stuff and some non-fiction too. And this book I've chosen is actually a piece of non-fiction. It's um, Notes on a Nervous Planet is about kind of uh, anxiety these days and how kind of the world we live in now kind of can serve to make us more anxious. And it has little parts of kind of the science on why that is, some advice on what we can do. Um, anxiety is something that I have kind of 
had a difficult relationship with um, over my life and I find parts of this book particularly uh, now during this uh, period of social distancing and isolation that we've got at the minute have really helped me. I'm just going to read part of it now for you. This is a note from the beach. Hello, I'm the beach. I am created by waves and currents. I am made of eroded rocks. I exist next to the sea. I have been around for millions of years. I was around at the dawn of life itself. And I have to tell you something. I don't care about your body. I am a beach. I literally don't give a flip. I am entirely indifferent to your body mass index. I am not impressed that your abdominal muscles are visible to the naked eye. I am oblivious. You are one of 200,000 generations of human beings. I have seen them all. I will see all the generations that come after you too. It won't be as many. I'm sorry. I hear the whispers the sea tell me. The sea hates you. The poisoners, that's what it calls you. A bit melodramatic, I know, but that's the sea for you. All drama. And I have to tell you something else. Even the other people on the beach don't care about your body. They don't. They're staring at the sea or they're obsessed with their own appearance. And if they are thinking about you, why do you care? Why do you humans worry so much about a stranger's opinion? Why don't you just do what I do? Let it wash all over you. Allow yourself to just be as you are. Just be. Just beach. And um, I really recommend that book for people at the moment as well. I think it's just a really nice piece of work. That's enough of that. Now, some of this. The Great Realization by Tom Robert. Tell me the one about the virus again, then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favorite. I promise, just once more. Okay, snuggle down my boy, though I know you know full well the story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. It always had our wants, but now it's got so quick. You could have everything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew squarer and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker till we couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them while down below we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac. Shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you pulled them out already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies. More convenient to die. But then, in 2020, a virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. But while we were all hidden amidst the fear and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys were gathering dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe, and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we'd found to the one we'd left behind. 
Old habits became extinct and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realization. And yes, since then there have been many, but that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's 2020. And finally! Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me here to talk to you a little bit about my passion, which is Irish music. And I'm going to be playing a little bit of Irish flute for you in a moment. So I'm really excited to share that with you all. My interest in Irish music began when I was about eight years old. I started off playing tin whistle, which is quite common to learn in schools. Initially, I was attracted to it because of the half hour I would get out of classes each week, but that was really a stepping stone um, into creating a huge amount of enjoyment and uh, creating a world of different experiences that I had throughout the years, playing in school concerts and competitions. And I think what I really enjoyed overall about that was playing with other musicians and, and sharing those experiences with other musicians. Irish music wasn't um, very prominent in our, my household. Um, and I think it, it was just something very personal to me, something that I really enjoyed and um, I never had big plans for it. It was always just something that I did as a hobby. I spent a lot of time uh, learning on my own, playing CDs and learning by ear most of the music that I still play today. That's, I suppose, one of the, the greatest aspects of my musical journey was the fact that I wasn't pressured into doing exams or learning much musical theory. It was just something that was always quite natural and something I did for fun. After finishing university, I moved here to Portugal. My father is Portuguese and my mother is Irish. And so I had always a keen interest in finding out a little bit more about my heritage. Um, initially, what hit me here in Portugal was the huge variety of, of different music from different cultures. Um, I love to listen to father music and um, it's something which I often find is quite similar in the traditional Irish music tradition. Um, so when I came here first, I was really overwhelmed by the amount of interest here in playing Irish music. I started playing with a band who each Monday we play a, a live session in a, a bar in Caixaldre. Um and I think it was quite ironic that I had never played Irish music in Ireland but coming here um, and seeing such enthusiasm I couldn't help but uh, feel like I needed to be a part of the Irish music scene here and so over the years um, playing with Portuguese musicians of Irish music I've really um, developed a lot, learned a lot and yeah, challenging myself all the time to learn new songs to share and to keep improving and, and growing in my musical experience. The song I'm going to play for you is A Slow Air. It's uh, quite an old Irish song and it's called Time Shame Colla and it means I am sleeping. The song personifies Ireland as this sleeping woman who is calling to her people to stand up and fight back against foreign invaders. The song itself is very um, haunting and I really love the melody of this song. It's quite different to a lot of Irish jigs and reels which are upbeat. This one has a more melancholic feel and uh, yeah, I, I hope you you enjoy it. Okay, so here we go.
Okay, well, that's all from me. I right, hope you're all doing okay at home and staying safe and I look forward to seeing you all in the future. So that's it. End of the episode. Watch this space because we are going to be getting in touch with you to tell you how to get in touch with us. And then maybe next time you'll hear your voice on the British Council's Sunshiny Day podcast. stop <laughs> oh, it says that you started recording now wait no, stop I don't know how to recording stop. okay this meeting is being up? recorded are you sure you want to stop stop recording see you next time goodbye